From the moment the invasion began, the Russo-Ukrainian war has been filled with twists and turns. At first, Russia and its president Vladimir Putin believed Ukraine would crumble in no more than a week. However, Ukraine displayed indomitable spirit and turned this would-be swift conquest into an unpredictable battle lasting over two years. What's more, with the help of Western allies, Ukraine has made Russia look inferior, struggling to maintain its grip in the face of relentless defiance. But just as Russia was practically written off by the West, the country managed to bounce back almost miraculously, replenishing its troops and military equipment. So now a freshly invigorated Russia is on the offensive. And Ukraine is running out of weapons. And the necessary aid is just not coming. It's no wonder Europe is already preparing for a potential Russian victory. Though numerous scenarios concerning Europe's fate have been floated around, they all share the same premise. Putin isn't just going to stop a Ukraine. If he does win the war, all of Europe will be at his mercy. However, he can't just launch a war against an entire continent, though to be fair, that does seem like something he might try, given his dangerous delusions and imperial ambitions. No, if he does invade Europe, he'll likely start closer to home, targeting countries that were once part of the Soviet Union. The countries in question are the so-called Baltic states, Estonia, Latvia and Lithuania. But although these countries were once under Soviet control, they're now independent states and, more importantly, members of an alliance that isn't too fond of Russia's antics. NATO. And remember, an attack against one NATO member is considered an attack against all. If Putin is foolish enough to attack the Baltic states, he likely won't face just a few small nations, more like a united front of some of the world's most powerful militaries. But let's face it, Putin was foolish enough to attack Ukraine, so who's to say he won't try his luck against NATO too? Plus, there are ways to subdue a country without a direct military attack, and Russia is well acquainted with these tactics. With this in mind, let's see what a Russian victory in the Russo-Ukrainian war would mean for Europe and the rest of the world. One thing's for certain, things are going to get ugly. But how did we even get here? Didn't Western military experts proclaim that Putin is down and out? They absolutely did, and for good reason. No one could have predicted how fast Russia would recuperate. Even US intelligence officials were certain it would take Russia at least a decade to fully recover from the losses suffered on the Ukrainian battlefield. Yet somehow Russia managed to do so in a matter of months. Though to be fair, the country's military capabilities are nowhere near fully restored but they aren't fully crushed either. What's making this dire situation even more worrisome is the fact that the US is withholding military aid to Ukraine. But why? After all, the US has been Ukraine's staunchest supporter throughout the conflict, spending roughly $175 billion on military aid. The current holdup seemingly has to do with an assumption that the war in Ukraine will remain a stalemate regardless of what the US does. However, the situation on the battlefield clearly suggests otherwise. Russia has been taking full advantage of the missing aid to break out of positional warfare and launch more aggressive offensives. Its aircraft are dropping bombs left and right as Ukraine's air defense dwindles, and Russian troops are pushing deeper into Ukrainian territory, seizing roughly 140 square miles of territory in 2024 alone. That's not to mention that Russia is poised to overshoot Ukraine 10 to 1 very soon. And all because Ukraine has virtually no means to defend itself. It needs more air defense systems, artillery and munitions. More, more, more. If these don't arrive on time, Russia will likely emerge victorious as early as 2025. But what does a Russian victory even entail? Despite a popular misconception, Kyiv doesn't have to fall for Russia to win in Ukraine. Russia can win in a much more non-violent way. All it takes is for Ukraine to call for a ceasefire, as the country runs out of forces and firepower and all the cards would be handed to Russia. The country would likely use this opportunity to request a new Ukrainian regime, expel NATO, destroy Ukrainian weaponry and seize parts of the country. In other words, Russia would tear Ukraine apart piece by piece until there's nothing left but a demilitarized puppet state. But regardless of how Russia achieves victory in Ukraine, one thing's for sure, that victory would cost Europe dearly. So let's dive into this worst-case scenario. Let's see what will happen if Russia wins the war in Ukraine. There's no doubt about it, Ukraine will be hit the hardest. Well, at least at first. There would likely be a massive exodus of people fleeing the country to escape Russian control. We're talking millions of people and a potential refugee crisis in Europe and beyond. After all, staying in the country likely means facing horrifying violence and human rights abuses, even perhaps large-scale civilian killings. Basically, Russia wants to fully absorb Ukraine and is willing to eradicate the Ukrainians who don't comply. But if the Russian invasion of Ukraine taught us anything, it's that Ukrainians won't go down without a fight. 
there will likely be a massive Ukrainian insurgency fighting against Russian occupation. But the bad news is that Russia knows this too. That's why the country is already preparing specialized military units to handle such an insurgency. In other words, Ukrainians likely don't stand a chance. But what about the rest of Europe? As mentioned at the beginning of the video, the Baltic states would likely be Putin's next target, with the rest of Eastern Europe being on high alert, and for good reason. Prior to the invasion, Ukraine acted as a buffer between Russia and this part of Europe. But if Ukraine falls, there's nothing standing in Putin's way. Well, except for NATO, but we'll get to that later. For now, let's focus on Russia and how it might deploy its troops after a victory in Ukraine. First things first, a victory in Ukraine would bring about a much larger and significantly more dangerous Russian military. The country is already conscripting men en masse, including those in occupied Ukrainian regions. These new conscripts are neither adequately trained nor treated as humans, as they're often sent to die in brutal human wave offensives. The fall of Ukraine into Russia's hands would lead to an influx of these ill-fated conscripts, and hundreds of thousands of Ukrainians would be forced to join the Russian military. Throw spending over 7% of GDP on the military into the mix and it becomes clear Russia's in it for the long haul. It's essentially adapted its entire economy and society to sustain war efforts. From how Russia is positioning its growing troops, it becomes evident which country of the Baltic Three might be targeted first. Estonia Russia has already published plans to establish a new Northwest Army Corps dangerously close to this country. This is a stark contrast to the pre-invasion situation, as Russia used to have only one airborne division and mechanized infantry brigade near the Estonian border. In other words, Estonia faced no serious conventional military threat from Russia, much like the rest of Eastern Europe. If Ukraine falls, this will surely change. Russia will be able to bring much of the forces previously tied up in Ukraine to Estonian borders. But for some reason, Western military experts keep dismissing this possibility. They believe that Russia will only move two newly created armies to the borders of Estonia and other Baltic countries, the one deployed in Crimea and the one deployed on the eastern borders of Ukraine and Belarus. As for the rest of the Russian troops, they are estimated to return to their previous bases within the Russian boundaries. But these bases are no way adequate for Russia's strategic goals, so the country is more likely to establish new bases that bring it closer to the Baltic states and, in turn, NATO. But where could Russia launch an attack against Estonia from precisely? Well, there's a city in northeastern Estonia practically overflowing with ethnic Russian population. This city is even connected to Russia through a bridge symbolically named the Friendship Bridge. Russia could use this bridge, and the friendship promise it holds, to come to the rescue of the Russian nationals living in Narva. But why would Russians need any help in Narva? The simple answer is they wouldn't. This is just a tactic Russia might employ to try and seize the Baltic countries without a NATO intervention. The process is simple. Cause internal strife in the country. Storm in under the guise of protecting the local population. And that's it. NATO might have issues deciding whether or not to intervene, as the conflict would be perceived as an internal struggle. If this strategy fails, Russia could threaten a short-notice mechanized offensive against Estonia, with at least eight divisions, backed by reserves from the First Guards Tank Army, which was always meant to be the primary offensive unit against NATO. That's not to mention that Russian ground troops would be covered by an extensive air defense network consisting of S-300, S-400, and S-500 anti-missile systems. So now we're talking about a more direct attack. Wouldn't this trigger Article 5 of the North Atlantic Treaty? There's no doubt about it, it would. But just because NATO is obliged to defend its member state doesn't mean the alliance will have an easy time doing so. In fact, NATO would definitely not be able to defend Estonia against a short-term attack with the forces it currently has in Europe. As a result, the US would have to deploy a sizable portion of its ground forces to the Baltic region and the entire NATO eastern border. The same goes for the US's fleet of stealth aircraft, which would likely have to be permanently moved to Europe. These aircraft will be used to annihilate Russian air defense systems, thus preventing Russia from sending non-stealthy aircraft and missiles to wreak havoc across Estonia. And these aircraft will be successful, there's no question about it. But at what cost? Committing a substantial stealth aircraft fleet to Europe means taking away from Taiwan. This, in turn, means that the US wouldn't be able to successfully protect Taiwan against a potential Chinese invasion. And a Chinese invasion of Taiwan is very likely to happen if Russia wins in Ukraine. In fact, experts believe that Putin's success would encourage more countries than just China to invade a neighbor. Venezuela and Azerbaijan also top the list. This means that Russia's victory would likely trigger a domino effect of global conflicts, reshaping the world order as we know it. But for now, let's stick to Europe. As mentioned, Estonia wouldn't be the only country on the receiving end of Russian aggression. 
After all, Putin and other Russian nationalists have been quite public and clear about one thing. The status of all the NATO member Baltic states that have previously been part of the Soviet Union and the Russian Empire is far from settled in their eyes. As Russia sees it, these states rightfully belong under Russian control. Besides being geographically close and historically linked, the Baltic states also have a notable number of ethnic Russian population. Estonia, Russia's first target, has about 22.5% ethnic Russians, which is around 375,000 people. In Narva, for instance, this figure reaches a staggering 87.7%, which is what makes the city perfect as a starting point for a large-scale invasion. The total percentage is even higher in Latvia, potentially Russia's next target, with 25% or 445,000 ethnic Russians living in the country. Lithuania only has 5% ethnic Russians, around 145,000 people, but this will in no way deter Russia from using similar tactics to justify an intervention in the country. Since this is precisely what Russia has been doing, using the number of ethnic Russians living in these countries to justify any future actions aimed at asserting control over them. According to Putin, the fact that such a large number of ethnic Russians are living outside Russia is a humanitarian disaster of epic proportions. That's rich coming from the guy orchestrating humanitarian atrocities on the daily, but we digress. Besides having a high number of ethnic Russians living in the country, Latvia seems to be high on Putin's list of targets due to some recent changes in immigration laws. Unfortunately, this massive Russian minority also makes Latvia the weakest link in the Baltic chain. Given that there are still some Latvian parties striving for closer ties with Russia, Putin might not take a violent route with Latvia, well at least for now. The Kremlin might first try to incite resistance to the current Latvian government and subdue the country from within. Staging an uprising in communities with a Russian majority, such as the Latgala region, could also do the trick. If Russia manages to cause enough political unrest before the next elections scheduled for 2027, the country should have no issues swooping in with a swift but concentrated attack on Latvia, bringing the country under its control. The attack in question would be carried out with substantially superior forces, as Russia had learned from the mistakes it made when initially invading Ukraine. Lithuania, on the other hand, won't fall as easily. Even now, while Russia is still sticking to grey zone tactics, a difference in how Lithuania and Latvia act toward the country is more than evident. For instance, when Russia came out with an outrageous decree to revise its borders in the Baltic Sea to the detriment of the Baltic states, Latvia was focused on clarifying and rectifying the situation. Lithuania, in contrast, labelled this move as a deliberate, targeted escalatory provocation, sending a clear message to Russia – such actions won't be tolerated. But courageous statements aside, does Lithuania stand a chance against Russia? Numbers-wise, the answer is a resounding no. As of 2024, Russia has roughly 1.32 million active duty personnel, and the plan is for this number to reach 1.5 million in the foreseeable future, and then there's the 2 million reservists. Combine these two figures together and you get a number that's higher than the entire population of Lithuania. And at 2.8 million residents, Lithuania is the biggest country out of the Baltic Three. Of course, Russia wouldn't be able to wage an attack with its active duty force, nor would Lithuania only defend itself with its measly 23,000 active duty soldiers. But let's put this aside for a second and discuss how this attack might unfold geographically. At the moment, the biggest danger from Lithuania comes from the neighboring Kaliningrad, a Russian-run mini-state. This region has become increasingly militarized in recent years, housing systems like the Iskander Mobile short-range ballistic missiles. For this reason, Kaliningrad could become a launching pad for an attack on Lithuania. Some military experts even believe that Lithuania might be the first Russian target after Ukraine due to the sheer proximity of Kaliningrad, as well as its military divisions and capabilities. Once again, NATO would have a pretty hard time defending the country. This especially applies if former US President Donald Trump is re-elected in 2024. Trump has continuously criticized NATO over the years and repeatedly promised to weaken US's commitment to NATO if re-elected. If this happens, Lithuania might become low-hanging fruit for Russia. The same goes for the rest of Eastern Europe. How so? Well, Russia is likely to take advantage of any perceived NATO weakness to send in special forces in unmarked uniforms, the so-called Little Green Men, to set up roadblocks at the Sawalki Gap, the narrow strip of land between Kaliningrad and Belarus, which connects Lithuania to Poland. A similar strategy was used in Crimea in 2014, a peninsula that was later used as a springboard for the full-scale invasion of Ukraine. If the Sawalki Gap falls under Russian control, Russia has a clear path toward Poland and the rest of Eastern Europe. Poland, Slovakia and Romania are often quoted as the countries Putin might go after next. Plus, capturing the Sawalki Gap would effectively cut off the Baltic states from the rest of NATO, making it easier to keep them under control. 
Considering what's at stake, Russia would have to prepare and conduct this attack fast enough to avoid leaving any time for NATO to introduce large reinforcements from France, Germany, and the US. For this reason, the bulk of Russian forces needed to secure the Sawalki Gap would likely be brought in from the newly re-established Leningrad and Moscow military districts, as these forces can move to attack positions much more rapidly and stealthily. But even if NATO countries become aware of this takeover, would they react? Sure, Poland, the Baltic states, and the Scandinavian countries would likely call for drastic measures and tough actions. However, the US would probably be only be able to provide logistical support, while Germany and France might hold back altogether, fearing that Russia might set its sights on Western Europe next. Of course, there's also the ever-looming threat of nuclear weapons entering the conflict. It goes without saying that this will be a nightmare scenario with only one possible outcome – an apocalypse of unimaginable horror. This worst-case scenario is probably the number one reason Russia would be allowed to carry on with its antics once it reached the Sawanki Gap. All things considered, it's abundantly clear that things can't be allowed to go this far. NATO must turn the tide before it's too late. After all, the alliance is far superior to Russia in terms of military power and technology and can't allow Russia to bully its way into reshaping the world order. So what's being done to prevent this from happening? Since US aid is still up in the air, the focus has been shifted to deterrence. The Baltic states know they're next in line if Ukraine falls. Worst of all, they won't face a weakened Russia, but one emboldened by its success in Ukraine. A country that believes it's defeated a unified Western Front all alone. A frightening prospect indeed. That's why Estonia, Lithuania, and Latvia have started creating massive border defenses, but these moves aren't exactly new. Ever since Russia illegally annexed Crimea in 2014, the Baltic states have been ringing the alarm about the potentially disastrous consequences of this move. Unfortunately, no one seems to have been listening back then. But this didn't stop the Baltic states from taking proactive measures. One of the most significant was increasing their military budget to 3% of their GDP. This increased budget will partly be used for the border defenses we just mentioned. The so-called Baltic Defense Zone will be set up on the borders with Russia and Belarus, a country that's been increasingly cozying up to Russia. This zone will primarily consist of physical defensive structures like bunkers. Estonia alone plans to begin the construction of roughly 600 bunkers in early 2025. Besides these shared defenses, the Baltic states have also been working on strengthening their troops. To this end, Latvia reintroduced conscription in 2023 after stopping mandatory military service in 2006, the only Baltic country to do so. Estonia, for its part, has managed to double its defense force to 20,000 people, while Latvia has the same ambitions. For the latter country, the goal is to double the armed forces to about 60,000 soldiers by 2032. As for Lithuania, the country made a deal with Germany, which would bring 4,800 troops to the country by 2027 to defend its territory against Russia. The Baltic states have also been taking steps to fortify the area surrounding the two major flashpoints in a potential conflict, Kaliningrad and the Sawalki Gap. However, since deterrence doesn't always work with Russia, the Baltic states and the rest of Eastern Europe have also been devising new battle plans, as Hanno Pevkor, Estonian Minister of Defense, puts it. Of course, he didn't share any details, but it's clear that the Baltic states are taking the Russian threat more than seriously. Though this is by no means surprising. It's a standard practice to prepare security policies for what might happen. What has changed, however, is the views on Russia's territorial aims and its readiness to use ruthless force. This change has significantly impacted how NATO and its allies strategize. But even while Ukraine still stands, the Baltic states aren't free from Russian attacks. The only difference is that these attacks are more sly, representing the so-called hybrid warfare strategy. Here are just some of the hybrid warfare tactics Russia has used so far. Russia tried to recruit Estonian citizens to attack their own government. It's been actively trying to create a crisis on the borders of the Baltic countries by sending waves of migrants towards them. It's used hacking, leaking, and similar disinformation campaigns to destabilize the political landscape. Basically, Russia's goal was to promote general insecurity in the Baltic region before moving on to more decisive and aggressive actions. All things considered, we're left with three possible scenarios if Russia wins in Ukraine. Scenario 1. The Baltic states fall under Russian control. In this scenario, Russia continues its aggressive expansion into Europe, fueled by Putin's dreams of a new Russian empire. NATO's response is hampered by internal divisions and a fear of escalating the conflict into a full-blown war. As a result, the Baltic states are overwhelmed relatively quickly, creating a new sphere of influence in Eastern Europe and opening the doors to further Russian advances into neighboring countries. Scenario number 2. A prolonged stalemate. In this scenario, NATO and the Baltic states do everything in their power to avoid a conflict altogether. 
This includes continuing to increase NATO's military presence and support in the Baltic region, as well as the country's individual defences. This scenario will likely lead to a prolonged standoff, with both sides engaging in periodic skirmishes and hybrid warfare tactics. Though an all-out war will be avoided, this scenario also turns the Baltic region into a highly militarized zone, with an ever-looming threat of escalation. And scenario number three, NATO successfully deters further aggression. With Europe's security at stake, NATO has no choice but to find a way to appropriately respond to the Russian threat and deter any further military action. This scenario can only work if the alliance continues to receive the necessary support from the US, which would, in turn, rally the rest of NATO members to display a united front and take decisive action against Russia. In this scenario, Russia would be forced to either reconsider its expansionist ambitions or face overwhelming resistance and likely its downfall. So what do you think? Which of these scenarios seems most likely? Or is there a fourth scenario that you see taking place if Russia is to win in Ukraine? Share your theories in the comments section below.